process, make sure. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, so I won't attempt to do this talk in Spanish. I'm sorry, but no way. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. Um, maybe quickly about me. I'm Philip. I'm a developer with ThoughtWorks. Presented quite, tried quite prominently on top. It's a little cut off, but it doesn't matter for this type of slide. So. Um, Quick question first um, of the people here. Who is a developer? Who is an XD or UI or UX or anything related to developing a product in the sense of writing, uh, writing, uh, making images, writing code or anything? Not planning, but actually the design work. So, okay, cool. So um, a while ago, we had a client come to us. And they said, hey, we've got this coffee machine. It's an awesome coffee machine. It makes really great coffee. And it makes broth, and it makes foam, and you can add milk. And it basically what, what it produces is liquid gold. And we said, sounds great. We are a software company. What are you coming to us for? What, what do you want with us? Well, it's not just a coffee machine. So one thing is they wanted to have it, there are many different coffee machines, and they make good coffee. So what they wanted to have was a complete system. They wanted to have a back end that knew what, uh, if the coffee machine was regularly serviced. They wanted to know, OK, there's a problem now, so we can already order replacement parts. They wanted the user to have a smartphone where they can control how much milk, how much foam, what kind of coffee they want to have. And it's actually, it sounded like an interesting idea. So you can have your own personalized coffee, carry it with you in a pocket, and wherever you go, you can just have this exact amount of milk, this um, exact amount of foam, just like you want it. So, ah, that sounds interesting. That's, that's something we can do. We know backends, we know applications, so let's work on that. Just maybe give us two, three, four of those machines, we'll get started, and we will give you a great app and a backend in the next half year or so, and we'll work with you, you can change requirements. We do it just what, like we're used to. We write stories, and we prioritize, and we have a bike block and everything. Yeah, there was no coffee machine. There wouldn't actually be a coffee machine for one and a half years after we started working on the software. There was, after about eight months, we got a machine that could make kind of brown, smelly water and make it hot. But we, they even told us, you are not allowed to drink this. This is not safe for you to drink. So yeah. So how do you work with that? How do you spend one a year and a half working, developing software for something that doesn't exist, something that you can't test with, something that you can't interact with? And we tried a few things. So what I'm going to present you now is more of a collection of method ideas that built up over the last two, three projects in my mind. This is by far not the definite answer. This is also not a method that I found anywhere. It's something where you say, OK, this is Scrum, and we adapted it. Or so this is just a collection of my experiences. And like you saw on the keynote yesterday, this is very much at the early stage where we don't know yet. We need to figure out what works, what doesn't work. So this is not a solution. So hardware is really hard to work with. Hardware is hard to do iterative. You can't say, OK, first we make a machine that produces water. Then we make a machine that makes water hot. Next step, we make a machine that makes water hot and smelly. And sometime in the end, you have a machine that makes coffee. It doesn't usually work like that, because once you start producing a circuit board, it's hard to just say, oh, yeah, now we add something later on, and then we remove that over there and add something more. And also, it's by definition almost an iterative process. So you start with something, and then it takes months till that's produced. Even if you do rapid produ producing of the boards, it takes days to say, OK, I've I have this idea, I want to test it out. It will take a day or two until you get the board. Then you need to put the components on. And then after three or four days, you have 
it done. It doesn't work like we say, oh, we, let's reprioritize. Uh, re Next week we are going to do something completely different. It, you need to plan ahead, and because of this it becomes waterfall often, because you need to plan ahead, and at some point there's a deadline. You say, okay, at some point we have a factory that will produce a coffee machine. Once that starts, it's really hard to change. It's, you can't say, oh yeah, we, we thought of something new. Stop the production line. I know you're producing 10,000 units per day, but now stop everything. We need to change something. And next week we might to change it again, and then afterwards again, no one will want to work with you. There are some companies that are trying to, to change this. So there's a method or a concept called lean manufacturing, which tries to improve on the production process, but it's still not like we know software development in an agile way. So it's still very much uh, focused on produce, building the thing just as you need them, but it's not about rapidly changing what you're producing afterwards. And uh, if you want to look it up, there's a great company called Othermill, which does quite a lot of interesting things about, for each machine, they are tracking how did we assemble this so that they can later see, oh, we have lots of failure rates with these machines. Did they all get assembled the same way? So can we change something? And then they just change it in production. But they are producing a few thousand products a year. It's not on the scale, the scale of 10,000 units a day, which is what you have when you talk about coffee machines or other like commodity goods. So hardware is generally still waterfall. And because of this, often the hard software side of these hardware companies is also more waterfall oriented. But software is becoming more and more important in hardware projects. If you look at startups, especially at the Kickstarter, Indiegogo things, there are smart locks, smart doorknobs, smart light switches, smart light bulbs. There's Everything can be smart, and that's usually hardware and software needing to work together. And if you go the way of saying, okay, we will work with a separate company to produce the hardware, then often you will find that they work very much in a waterfall model, or very much at least not like we are used to working. So they have clear ideas, okay, so First, we will start working on the Bluetooth, and that will take some time, and then in the meantime, someone else will develop the hardware for this, and then we can start working on this. It takes some getting used to. And just an example, in, uh, I think in the latest Toyota, so there's more than 100 million lines of code, software on the car, but it's all developed by, almost all developed by embedded systems engineers which are a subgroup of the mechanical engineering department. So pretty much any automotive company, the software department grew out of the mechanical engineering and the electrical engineering. There's no software engineering that started agile, started doing this. So there's lots of combined hardware software projects and somehow we will need to work together in the future. So how do we do that, especially if we can't have the final machine, and especially how do you do that in an agile way? If we stay with waterfall, it becomes pretty easy. The results will suck, but it will be pretty easy to work like that. Won't be fun, it won't be good, but yeah. Um, one thing we did was we tried to use lots and lots of prototypes. And by prototypes, I use this term very broadly in this case. So prototypes can be test doubles, fake, mocks, spikes, whatever you call them. I, I say prototype to mean something that resembles the final product in some way, but is built by cutting corners. Or it, there's something that is like the final product, but, well, if you could build the final product in two days, you would. So by definition, prototypes lack something, either because you don't know how to build it yet, because you didn't have the time, or because you just don't need it. So there can be prototypes, for example, for design user interface. If you want to just try out 
how do I or orient my display, how, to, how many buttons do I need, stuff like that. You could also need mechanical or electrical prototypes. We as software developers, software companies, generally working in the era of more Java, Android, I don't know, probably don't need to do many mechanical prototypes, but we as companies that support a complete, they want to support a client in building a product, we might need to look at things and say, by the way, this doesn't look right. If you place it like this, you can't open the door in the front or you can't access this. So we might also need to do some mechanical or electrical prototypes at some point. There's prototypes, so at least I refer to them as prototypes, which are used for testing and integration. So let's say you have a coffee machine and you're building an app that wants to communicate with that coffee machine. How do you test out that app? How do you say, now I'm clicking brew and nothing happens, and now I want to make sure if I click brew that this happens and that this happens all the time. So you need something that you can test against. And especially if you do something like TDD, it becomes important, or if you do continuous integration, continuous deployment, you need to have some mock or some stop or something to, to deal with this. So, and then there's prototypes that go more in the area of a spike where you want to verify, okay, I'm thinking this should work. How do I know this? I'm thinking, okay, our Smart light bulb should be fast enough to change colors every couple of milliseconds so you can have a smooth fading. That's just something you need to either calculate very, very uh, annoyingly by counting cycles and looking at code, or you just build it quickly and see does this even roughly work, or I'm way off on my assumptions. So those are all things that I consider prototypes or uses for prototypes. This is my personal definition. This is not, I don't think this is anything that people agree on. Uh, it's just what I want to talk about when I talk about how do we do this. And um, in particular, now when I talk about rapid prototyping, for me it's important that we can do these things quickly. So rather than wait weeks for circuit board to be assembled and designed, I want to be able to test lots of this within a day or maybe within an hour to say, I have an idea, will this work? I don't want to wait weeks and put everything that depends on this off for two sprints. I want to know it now or I want to be able to plan it for the next iteration. So rapid prototyping in the manufacturing industry is a very defined set of certain uh, technological methods to do this, like 3D printing and uh, computer-controlled milling, and all those fall into rapid prototyping. For me, as a software developer, it's basically anything that allows me to be quick about this, not anything like, I don't know, sending something off somewhere else to get produced. So prototypes, as you might have been already might have already informed, they don't really have to be like the final product. So in a, if you come from manufacturing, you build a prototype, and then you can use it to show to your investors and use it for everything, and then you get a second prototype later on that's even more like the final product. In this case, if you want to have a prototype for testing or integration, it doesn't need to look like a coffee machine. It just needs to behave like a coffee machine. So. When, you st when I start building a prototype, this is again my process, the first thing is, why do I actually want it? So what, what's the problem I need to solve? Do I need it for UI? Do I need it for testing? Do I need it for integration? It's, there should be one specific reason why I, want, why I feel like I need something now, I need something to integrate with. I need so ask yourself what, what actually is the problem, and Try to be as specific as possible. So this is one very early example that I played around before I even had the idea about rapid prototyping. So this is basically I was trying to build a, like one of these sunrise simulating alarm clocks. So 
this is a plastic food container, and inside there should be lights. And the question I wanted to ask, do I want to have buttons in front, or do I want to have buttons on top? This is already way overkill. You don't need all these fancy lights, and there are lots of cables coming out there because I wanted to control the time. Actually, the question is, the red ones or the black ones on top? That's what I wanted to ask for this specific prototype. So try to be specific. The more specific you are, the faster you are, because you can leave out lots of and lots of stuff. And the easier it usually gets, and the clearer your answer will be. So if you have a prototype that you say, oh yeah, we started with that, and now we can do add that, and that, and that, and then it grows to this huge thing, and you, oh, before we can try out this, we need to change that. So no, try to stick to one specific question that, that you want answered. And yeah, limit yourself to that one specific question. Don't try to add on to it. And this is my all-time favorite prototype. This is a coffee machine. This uh, specifically, this was done to check, will this machine, in the way it looks now, will this work in a kitchen? We went, took this big styrofoam block, I think it took us a, a few minutes, maybe 50 minutes or so to build this, and went to first to the kitchen in our office and said, put it on the counter. Does it look right? Does it look too big? Does it work? Now we want to have a display on top here with buttons. Put it on the counter. Can, could you press the buttons or is it too big? Take someone else, someone smaller, someone bigger. Does it work? So this is very much probably something that the user interface design and user experience people will feel, yeah, that's standard behavior, that's standard thing we do with apps and everything. And if you want to do that, you don't need 3D printing. I like 3D printing, but it's way overused. This is a lot quicker, a lot easier, and it's a lot easier to make adjustments if you feel it's too big. So this is, for me, this is the definition of a lean, rapid prototype, because you can't get much faster than this. So another problem we had was this integration between the coffee machine and the app. So we want the app to work with a, with a um, coffee machine, but we don't have a coffee machine. So what we did, we defined how should the app work with a contract test, and then we built a fake for this that fulfills this contract test. And then we tested the app against the fake, and later on, we ran the contract test against the coffee machine. So this way, we knew that this coffee machine should behave like the fake we did. In this case, the prototype wasn't anything physically. It was a Node.js application, because we were doing REST calls. And so I also consider this a prototype. And unless you want to impress your stakeholders or peers or so, it's way easier than doing anything crazy. If you want, you can maybe add some, some box around the computer that runs it to say, yeah, this is our coffee machine now, but don't go overboard. That's, if you spend more than 50 minutes on making it pretty, that's probably too much for what you want to achieve. Yeah, and then later on, after a while, we had the coffee machine and the app. Actually, sounds a bit easier than it was. This step nearly never worked first. So every time we got an update of the firmware for the coffee machine, the contract test failed. We needed to tell the hardware people, yeah, by the way, you were returning zero instead of false, or you were returning a string instead of an integer. And then we had to decide, do we just want to fix it on our side? It's easy, it's fast. Or is it something important, and do we want to wait the two weeks, three weeks that it takes to fix this? So even after we had the coffee machine, when the firmware wasn't finished, we still relied a lot on this fake to be faster in our production. So the next step, once you've decided what's the problem that you want to solve, is skip. Skip as much as you can. So like I said, styrofoam block, all you need. If you want to make it more realistic, have someone behind the corner make sounds. So print out a display that looks like a display, pin it on top of the styrofoam block, and once the user presses the button, have someone go, 
and make the sound of the copy being brewed. This is, again, very much standard UX, but you can transform it to three-dimensional user interface. I'm not sure how many know this, having paper prototypes for apps where you just make lots and lots of drawings and then you switch out. Then you say, okay, you clicked on this, so now you will see this. You clicked on this, now you will see this. You can do this very easily with hardware and it's not, not at all more difficult. You might need a bit more material with styrofoam blocks. But that's, that's all that's needed. So skip, skip everything else. If you have to build something, only build the stuff you need. There's lots of ready-made things that you can use. So, uh, oh no, sorry. Um, so, oh, let me quickly check. Yeah, so that's where I wanted to go. Um, lots and lots of options. And take what you need. So a Raspberry Pi, for example, if you just want something, we had the problem, the coffee machine should start a Wi-Fi hotspot. And then we had a very complicated flow because the coffee machine needs to connect to the Wi-Fi, but it doesn't know your Wi-Fi password. It doesn't know your user. So it starts as a hotspot, then you connect, then you enter your credentials, then it shuts down the hotspot, then it connects again to your own Wi-Fi and so on. That we, we wanted to try this because Wi-Fi is annoying, very annoying. It's flaky, it's uh, network is problematic, so we didn't want to run all of this on one single computer, but we ended up using a BeagleBone, similar to a Raspberry Pi, and just writing a Node application. So we, nothing of the software that we used ended up in the real coffee machine. This was just something that was done in half a day or so to, to be able to say, okay, you have the app, this is a coffee machine, try to connect it to your network. We failed all the time. No one could connect because Wi-Fi cut out. We started transmitting something. Something got interrupted. So this was just to try this. Um, similar to Styrofoam, I like using Play-Doh. It's quite nice to get an idea of how big something is because you can shape it and you can say, OK, um, there's an example. Uh, what I, a product that I really like is a magic umbrella. So the idea is you have an umbrella where the handle glows if it will rain. So when you go out of your room, your umbrella will say, hey, wait a minute, take me with you, because it might rain. And to, to try and design this, you will need to fit a lot of components in a small space. And to figure out how much space you have, you can use Play-Doh and say, okay, can I grip this? If I grip it, where, how much space do I have? And then you can use cardboard cutouts of the different components that you want to fit in and see, do they fit into this space that I have left? Um, yeah, I also, this is a wooden smartphone with a slate, so if you want to have user graphics, it's use all of these if you need a particular aspect. Don't try to use a microcontroller if all you need is Wi-Fi connectivity. Try to, if you need to figure out is this processor fast enough to run everything we want to do, use the processor, but use an existing board for that processor. Don't use the final hardware that you want to use. Try to figure out what's the fastest way to get to use this. If you don't need anything at all, use software. So I'm not sure how many know this. This is Mount Bank. This is a mocking framework, which is quite easy to do. Or it's not a mocking framework, it's mocking of uh, HTTP interactions, so use this or a Node app or whatever you can do to make your, your whatever you have behave like the real thing without trying to build the real thing. If you could build your hardware within two days, you would build it. There has to be some way, some reason why you can't build it, and so the way to do that is use existing things. Um, yeah. Also, yeah, just remember, I also like stuff like these. These are plastic cards that get malleable when you put them in water, and then you can move them in shapes. And these are really nice, similar to Play-Doh, but more, uh, more persistent if you want to have something that 
lasts for longer than half a day or so. Yeah. So uh, this is an example uh, of a project where I wanted to control um, remote controlled power outlets via Wi-Fi. And basically what I've done here is the only thing I wanted to test is here. So I used an Arduino and I used an existing remote control and just cut the wires to connect it so that all the radio stuff I didn't have to deal with myself. And uh, that's also a good way to try to do it. Find something that, that does a similar thing and just cut off all the parts you, that you want to implement yourself. And similar, this is uh, for a project where we needed to, to do, um, it's actually a component that will end up in a vehicle. I can't show you the final result because it's not done yet and I'm not allowed to talk about who I'm working for. But um, the thing we wanted to try is basically, in the end, we want to communicate via cell, uh, cell phone network. We didn't have a cell phone network. We didn't have an existing thing. We just wanted to figure out network stack on the small microcontroller. So we bought an existing Eval board and we bought a Wi-Fi module. And everything we did on this was basically connect a few wires together. And that took us a few minutes. And then we could start working on the actual problem that we wanted to solve. So look around. It gets easier with time because you get have a big drawer full of components that you just know, oh yeah, I can just take this and this. Um, but so there's lots of ready-made things to try. And don't wait for the hardware developer. If you're working with a separate company, they can be really helpful, they can be really nice, but they, it will take weeks usually to get hardware done at all. So um, the next step would be, the last step would be throw away almost everything. I keep repeating myself. If you could build it, you would build it. By definition, what you've built is not good enough because it would be the final product, so don't reuse it over and over again for different tasks. The thing you should keep from this is mostly knowledge. It's similar to spikes or similar to mocks or so. There's it was one objective you had in mind, that's why you wanted to do it and then throw away everything else. Which also means that you will have lots and lots of prototypes for one product. So these are only the, the ones that you can see for the coffee machines. We had a couple which are not that nice because software doesn't look particularly impressive. So we had one to test the Wi-Fi connection. We had one to just test the user design. We had a screen. Uh, mock where users could see what it would look like. And this was the one we got from the hardware developer, which was basically all the hardware except what you need to, to heat water and to produce coffee. So this was to test the firmware and to run our tests against later on. Recap, ask, skip, build, and then throw away. So try, this is my personal. Uh, my personal list of steps that I try to follow and uh, do it often. If you limit yourself, then it should be quite quick and painless to do it. Because, um, so, if you don't do it, then this happens. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can see it. You can see this is at an angle. It doesn't connect quite right because this is one millimeter too far to the right it catches on the yellow thing. Usually, whenever I design a board, I print it out first, cut the paper out, and put it where I want to have it. If I had done this here, I would have noticed it would have taken maybe five to 10 minutes to do. I thought, oh no, looks fine, looks good. I've measured it out, and yeah, it still works. It's just really annoying, so. It, get in the habit of doing everything often and making sure it's as smooth as we possible. Yeah, so that's about it. Um, the feedback form, I think you've seen it. Um, my email address, if you want to come with questions, you can also ask me, but I think the conference is over pretty soon, so. <laughs> oh, oh, and yeah, um, like everyone we are hiring, we opened an office in Barcelona, so check it out, see if you are interested in this kind of thing, but. I think there's a pretty big market for developers now, so, yeah. Any questions?
No? Okay. If you want. Yeah.